a prisoner with power. As I entered and saluted Lorquas Patmel, signaled me to advance and fixing his great hideous eyes upon me, addressed me thus. You have been with us a few days, yet during that time, you have by your prowess won a high position among us. Be that as it may, you are not one of us. You owe us no allegiance. Your position is a peculiar one, he continued. You are a prisoner, and yet you give commands which must be obeyed. You are an alien, and yet you are a Tharkian chief. You are a midget, and yet you can kill a mighty warrior with one blow of your fist. And now you are reported to have been plotting to escape with another prisoner of another race. A prisoner who, from her own admission, half believes you are returned from the Valley of Dor. Either one of these accusations, if proved, would be sufficient grounds for your execution. But we are just people, and you shall have a trial on our return to Thark, if Tal Harjus so commands. But, he continued, in his fierce guttural tones, if you run off with the Red Girl, it is I who shall have to account to Tal Harjus. It is I who shall have to face Tars Tarkas and either demonstrate my right to command or the metal from my dead carcass will go to a better man, for such is the custom of Tharks. I have no quarrel with Tars Tarkas. Together we rule supreme the greatest of the lesser communities among the green men. We do not wish to fight between ourselves. And so if you were dead, John Carter, I should be glad. Under two conditions only, however, may you be killed by us without orders from Tal Harjus. In personal combat, in self-defense, should you attack one of us, or were you apprehended in an attempt to escape? As a matter of justice, I must warn you that we only await one of these two excuses for ridding ourselves of so great a responsibility. The safe delivery of the Red Girl to Tal Harjus is the greatest importance. Not in a thousand years have the Tharks made such a capture. She is the granddaughter of the greatest of the Red Jeddaks, who is also our bitterest enemy. I have spoken. The red girl told us that we were without the softer sentiments of humanity, but we are a just and truthful race. You may go. Turning, I left the audience chamber. So this was the beginning of Sarkoja's persecution. I knew that none other could be responsible for this report, which had reached the ears of Lorquas Potmel so quickly. And now I recalled those portions of our conversation which had touched upon escape and upon my origin. Sarkoja was at this time Tars Tarkas' oldest and most trusted female. As such, she was a mighty power behind the throne, for no warrior had the confidence of Lorquas Potmel to such an extent as did his ablest lieutenant Tars Tarkas. However, instead of putting our thoughts of possible escape from my mind, my audience with Lorquas Putmel only served to center my every faculty on this subject. Now, more than before, the absolute necessity for escape, insofar as Deja Thoris was concerned, was impressed upon me, for I was convinced that some horrible fate awaited her at the headquarters of Tal Harjus. As described by Sola, this monster was the exaggerated personification of all the ages of cruelty, ferocity, and brutality from which he had descended, cold, cunning, and calculating. He was also, in marked contrast to most of his fellows, a slave to that brute passion, which the waning demands for procreation upon their dying planet has almost stilled in the Martian beast. 
The thought that the divine Deja Thoris might fall into the clutches of such an abysmal atavism started the cold sweat upon me. Far better that we save friendly bullets for ourselves at the last moment, as did those brave frontier women of my lost land who took their own lives rather than fall into the hands of the Indian braves. As I wandered about the plaza, plaza lost in my gloomy foreboding, forebodings, Tars Tarkas approached me on his way from the audience chamber. His demeanor towards me was unchanged and he greeted me as though we had not just parted a few moments before. Where are your quarters, John Carter, he asked. I have selected none, I replied. It seemed best that I quartered either by myself or among the other warriors, and I was awaiting an opportunity to ask your advice. As you know, and I smiled, I am not yet familiar with all the customs of the Tharks. Come with me, he directed, and together we moved off across the plaza to a building which I was glad to see adjoined that occupied by Sola and her charges. My quarters are on the first floor of this building, he said, and the second floor is also fully occupied by warriors, but the third floor and the floors above are vacant. You may take your choice of these. I understand, he continued, that you have given up your woman to the Red Prisoner. Well, as you have said, your ways are not our ways, but you can fight well enough to do about as you please. And so, if you wish to give your woman to a captive, it is your own affair. But as a chieftain, you should have those to serve you. And in accordance with our customs, you may select any or all the females from the retinues of the chieftains whose medal you now wear. I thanked him, but assured him that I could get along very nicely without assistance, except in the matter of preparing food and so he promised to send women to me for this purpose, and also for the care of my arms and the manufacture of my ammunition, which he said would be necessary. I suggested that they might also bring some of the sleeping silks and furs, which belonged to me as spoils of combat, for the nights were cold and I had none of my own. He promised to do so and departed. Left alone, I ascended the winding corridor to the upper floors in search of suitable quarters. The beauties of the other buildings were repeated in this, and as usual, I was soon lost in a tour of investigation and discovery. I finally chose a front room on the third floor because this brought me nearer to Deja Thoris, whose apartment was on the second floor of the adjoining building. And it flashed upon me that I could rig up some means of communication whereby she might signal me in case she needed either my services or my protection. Adjoining my sleeping apartment were baths, dressing rooms, and other sleeping and living apartments. In all, some 10 rooms on this floor. The windows of the back rooms overlooked an enormous court which formed the center of the square made by the buildings which faced the four contiguous streets and which was now given over to the quartering of the various animals belonging to the warriors occupying the adjoining buildings. While the court was entirely overgrown with yellow moss-like vegetation, which blankets practically the entire surface of Mars, yet numerous fountains, statuary, benches and pergola-like contraptions bore witness to the beauty which the court must have presented in bygone times. When graced by the fair-haired, laughing people whom stern and unalterable cosmic laws had driven not only from their homes but from all except the vague legends of their descendants, <clears throat> one could easily picture the gorgeous foliage of the luxuriant Martian vegetation, which once filled this scene with life and color, the graceful figures of the beautiful women, the straight and handsome men, the happy frolicking children, all sunlight, happiness, and peace. It was difficult to realize that they had gone down through the ages of darkness, cruelty, and ignorance until their hereditary instincts of culture and humanitarianism 
had risen ascendant once more in the final composite race, which now was dominant upon Mars. My thoughts were cut short by the advent of several young females bearing loads of silks, weapons, furs, jewels, cooking utensils, and casks of food and drink, including considerable loot from the aircraft. All this, it seemed, had been the property of the two chieftains I had slain, and now, by the custom of the Tharks, it had become mine. At my direction, they placed the stuff in one of the back rooms and then departed, only to return with a second load, which they advised me constituted the balance of my goods. On the second trip, they were accompanied by 10 or 15 other women and youths, who it seemed formed the retinues of the two chieftains. They were not their families, nor their wives, nor their servants. The relationship was peculiar and so unlike anything known to us that it is most difficult to describe. All property among the green Martians is owned in common by the community, except the personal weapons, ornaments, and sleeping silks and furs of the individuals. These alone can one claim undisputed right to, nor may he accumulate more than these than are required for his actual needs. The surplus he holds merely as custodian, and it is passed on to the younger members of the community as necessary. The women and children of a man's retinue may be likened to a military unit for which he is responsible in various ways, as in matters of instruction, discipline, sustenance, and the exigencies of their continual roamings and their unending strife with other communities and the Red Martians. His women are in no sense wives. The Green Martians use no word corresponding in meaning with this earthly word. Their mating is a matter of community interest solely and is directed without reference to natural selection. The council of chieftains of each community control the matter as surely as the owner of a Kentucky racing stud directs the scientific breeding of his stock for the improvement of the whole. In theory, it may sound well, as is often the case with theories, but the result of ages of this unnatural practice coupled with the community interest in the offspring being held paramount to that of the mother it is shown in the cold, cruel creatures and their gloomy, loveless, mirthless existence. It is true that the green Martians are absolutely virtuous, both men and women, with the exception of such degenerates as tall Harches, but better far a finer balance of human characteristics, even at the expense of a slight and occasional loss of chastity. Finding that I must assume responsibility for these creatures, whether I would or not, I made the best of it and directed them to find quarters on the upper floors, leaving the third floor to me. One of the girls I charged with the duties of my simple cuisine and directed the others to take up various activities which had formerly constituted their vocations. Thereafter, I saw little of them, nor did I care to. Love making on Mars. Following the battle with the airships, the community remained within the city for several days, abandoning the homeward march until they could feel reasonably assured that the ships would not return. For to be caught on the open plains with a cavalcade of chariots and children was far from the desire of even so warlike a people as the Green Martians. During our period of inactivity, Tars Tarkas had instructed me in many of the customs and arts of war familiar to the Tharks, including lessons in riding and guiding the great beasts which bore the warriors. These creatures, which are known as Thoats, are as dangerous and vicious as their masters, but when once subdued are sufficiently tractable for the purposes of the green Martians. Two of these animals had fallen to me from the warriors whose metal I wore and in a short time I could handle them quite well as, a native, as the native warriors. The method was not at all complicated if the thoats did not respond with sufficient celerity 
to the telepathic instructions of their writers. They were dealt with. They were dealt a terrific blow between the ears with the butt of a pistol. And if they showed fight, this treatment was continued until the brutes either were subdued or had unseated their riders. In the latter case, it became a life and death struggle between the man and the beast. If the former were quick enough with his pistol, he might live to ride again upon some other beast. If not, his torn and mangled body was gathered up by his women and burned in accordance with Tharkian custom. My experience with Wula determined me to attempt the experiment of kindness in my treatment of my thoughts. First I taught them that they could not unseat me, and even wrapped them sharply between the ears to impress upon them my authority and mastery. And then by degrees, I won their confidence in much the same manner as I had adopted countless times with my many mundane mounts. I was ever a good hand with animals and by inclination, as well as because it brought more lasting and satisfactory results. I was always kind and humane in my dealings with the lower orders. I could take a human life if necessary with far less compunction than that of a poor, unreasoning, irresponsible brute. In the course of a few days, my thoughts were the wonder of the entire community. They would follow me like dogs, rubbing their great snouts against my body in awkward evidence of affection, and respond to my every command with an alacrity and docility, which caused the Martian warriors to ascribe to me the possession of some earthly power unknown on Mars. How have you bewitched them, said Tars Tarkas one afternoon when he had seen me run my arm far between the great jaws of one of my thoats, which had wedged a piece of stone between two of his teeth while feeding upon the moss-like vegetation within our courtyard. By kindness, I replied. You see, Tars Tarkas, the softer sentiments have their value, even to a warrior. In the height of battle, as well as upon the march, I know that my thoughts will obey my every command, and therefore my fighting efficiency is enhanced, and I am a better warrior for the reason that I am a kind master. Your other warriors would find it to the advantage of themselves as well, as of the community to adopt my methods in this respect. Only a few days since you yourself told me that these great brutes by the uncertainty of their tempers, often were the means of turning victory into defeat, since at a crucial moment they might elect to unseat and rend their riders. Show me how you accomplish these results, was Tars Tarkas' only rejoinder. And so I explained as carefully as I could the entire method of training I had adopted with my beasts, and later he had me repeat it before, before Lorquas Potmel and the assembled warriors. That moment marked the beginning of a new existence for the poor thoats. And before I left the community of Lorquas Potmel, I had the satisfaction of observing a regiment of as tractable and docile mounts as one might care to see. The effect on the precision and celerity of the military movements was so remarkable that Lorquas Potmel presented me with a massive anklet of gold from his own leg as a sign of his appreciation for my service to the Horde. On the seventh day, following the battle with the aircraft, we again took up the march towards Thark, all probability of another attack being deemed remote by Lorquas Potmel. During the days just preceding our departure, I had seen but little of Dejah Thoris as I had been kept very busy by Tars Tarkas with my lessons in the art of Martian warfare, as well as the training of my thoughts. The few times I had visited her quarters, she had been absent walking upon the streets with Sola or investigating the buildings in the near vicinity of the plaza. I had warned them against venturing far from the plaza for fear of the great white apes, whose ferocity I was only too well acquainted with. However, since Wula accompanied them on all their excursions, and as Sola was well-armed, 
there was comparatively little cause for fear. On the evening before our departure, I saw them approach along one of the great avenues which led into the plaza from the east. I advanced to meet them and telling Sola that I would take responsibility for Deja Thora's safekeeping, I directed her to return to her quarters on some trivial errand. I liked and trusted Sola, but for some reason I desired to be alone with Deja Thoris, who represented to me all that I had left behind upon earth in agreeable and congenial companionship. There seemed bonds of mutual interest between us as powerful as though we had been born under the same roof rather than upon different planets, hurtling through space some 48 million miles apart. She shared my sentiments in this respect, I was positive, for on my approach, the look of the pit pitiful hopelessness left her sweet countenance to be replaced by a smile of joyful welcome as she placed her little right hand upon my left shoulder in true Red Martian salute. Sarkoja told Sola that you had become a true Thark, she said, and that I would now see no more of you than any of the other warriors. Sarkoja is a liar of the first magnitude, I replied, notwithstanding the proud claim of the Tharks to absolute verity. Deja Thoris laughed. I knew that even though you became a member of the community, you would not cease to be my friend. A warrior may change his mettle, but not his heart, as the saying is upon Barzoom. I think they have been trying to keep us apart, she continued. For whenever you have been off duty, one of the older women of Tars Tarkas retinue has always arranged to trump up some excuse to get Sola and me out of sight. They have me down in the pits below the buildings, helping them mix their awful radium powder and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have to be manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You have noticed that their bullets explode when they strike an object? Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder almost solid in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. The moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes this powder, it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. If you ever witness a night battle, you will note the absence of these explosions, while the morning following the battle will be filled at sunrise with sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired preceding the preceding night. As a rule, however, non-exploding projectiles are used at night. While I was much interested in Deja Thoris's explanation of this wonderful adjunct to Martian warfare, I was more concerned by the immediate problem of their treatment of her. They were keeping her away from me was not a matter for surprise, but that they should subject her to dangerous and arduous labor filled me with rage. Have they ever subjected you to cruelty and ignominy, Deja Thoris, I asked, feeling the hot blood of my fighting ancestors leap in my veins as I awaited her reply. Only in little ways, John Carter, she answered, nothing that can harm me outside of my pride. They know that I am the daughter of 10,000 Jeddaks, but I trace my ancestry back without a break to the builder of the first great waterway and they, who do not even know their own mothers, are jealous of me. At the heart, they hate their horrid fates, and so wreak their poor spite on me who stand for everything they have not, and for all they most crave and never can attain. Let us pity them, my chieftain, for even though we die at their hands, we can afford them pity, since we are greater than they and they know it. I had known the significance of those words, my chieftain, as applied by a red Martian woman to a man. I should have had the surprise of my life, but I did not know at the time, nor for many months thereafter. 
Yes, I still had much to learn upon Barzoom. I presume it is the better part of wisdom that we bow to our fate with a good grace, as good grace is as possible, Deja Thoris. But I hope nevertheless that I may be present the next time that any Martian, green, red, pink, or violet, has the temerity to even so much as frown on you, my princess. Deja Thoris caught her breath at my last words and gazed upon me with dilated eyes and quickening breath. And then, with an odd little laugh which brought roguish dimples to the corners of her mouth, she took her head and cried. What a child, a great warrior, and yet stumbling little child, what, what have I done now? I asked in sore perplexity. Someday you shall know, John Carter, if we live, but I may not tell you. And I, the daughter of Mors Kajak, son of Tardos Mors, have list, listened without anger, she soliloquized in con conclusion. Then she broke out again into one of her gay, happy, laughing moods, joking with me on my prowess as a Thark warrior, as contrasted with my soft heart and natural kindliness. I presume that you should accidentally wound an enemy. You would take him home and nurse him back to health, she laughed. That is precisely what we do on Earth, I answered, at least among civilized men. This made her laugh again. She could not understand it, for with all her tenderness and womanly sweetness, she was still a Martian, and to a Martian the only good enemy is a dead enemy. For every dead foeman means so much more to divide those who live. I was very curious to know what I had said or done to cause her so much perturbation a moment before, and so I continued to importune her to enlighten me. No, she exclaimed, it is enough that you have said it and that I have listened, and when you learn, John Carter, and if I be dead, as likely I shall be ere the moon has circled Barzoom another twelve times, remember that I listened and that I smiled. It was all Greek to me, but the more I begged her to explain, the more positive became her denials of my request. And so, in very hopelessness, I desisted. Day had now given away to night, and as we wandered along the great avenue lighted by the two moons of Barsoom, and with earth looking down upon us, out of her luminous green eyes, it seemed that we were alone in the universe, and I, at least, was content that it should be so. The chill of the Martian night was upon us, and removing my silks, I threw them across the shoulders of Deja Thoris. As my arm rested for an instant upon her, I felt a thrill pass through every fiber of my being, such as contact with no other mortal had even produced. And it seemed to me that she had leaned slightly toward me but of that I was not sure. Only I knew that as my arm rested there across her shoulders longer than the act of adjusting the silk required, she did not draw away, nor did she speak. And so in silence we walked the surface of a dying world, but in the breast of one of us at least had been born that which is ever oldest yet ever new. I loved Deja Thoris. The touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder had spoken to me in words I would not mistake, and I knew that I had loved her since the first moment that my eyes had met hers that first time in the plaza of the dead city of Korad.